Hi there, good day. Uh, this is the Travel Companion Podcast, where we talk about all things uh, travel, uh, responsible travel, sustainable travel, and special guest today is Dr. Hans Friedrich, who is based in Gozo. Gozo is in Malta. The conversation is via Skype, and the conversation is going to be about climate-friendly travel, bamboo, and coronavirus, and how this affects the travel industry. Sustainable development is the balance between use and protection. Now, Hans has a long list of credentials, 35 years of working experience in Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, was working for a long time with the IUCN, that's the International Union for Conservation of Nature. He was Director General of the International Network for Bamboo and Rattan, that's INBAR. Currently, he is a board member of SunX, that's the Strong Universal Network. He's senior advisor for the European Bamboo Plantation Program, and he is ambassador for the World Bamboo Organization, which is a global network of individual bamboo specialists, which is managed from the USA. So it was fantastic to have him on the podcast. If you would like to support the podcast, please go to our website, that's podcast.org. And without further ado, here is the podcast with Hans Friedrich. And so we're here with uh, Dr. Hans Friedrich. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, you do indeed, yes. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And uh, first of all, happy Earth Day. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that important to you, uh, Earth Day? Well, you know, Earth Day, of course, it's an important event because everybody talks about it. But for me, every day is Earth Day, really. Uh, yeah. I don't think we should just just think about Earth one one day a year. We should think about Earth all the time. No, but you can maybe maybe just tell other people to think about Earth sometimes as well, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's always good to have a day where you can uh, talk even louder and then get people that normally might not think about it, think about these issues. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. So, uh, um, just a quick, um, from what I know from your side, you had a long past working um, in sustainability. Um, you worked for 35 years in uh, Africa, Asia, Europe. Um, you were working um, uh, with the IUCN, that's the International Union for Conservation of Nature, for a long period, 24 years I have here. And, Correct, yeah. yeah. And Director General of the International Network for Bamboo and Rattan, Imbar. And you're based at that point in Beijing, uh, China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, you're now living on, on, on the island of uh, Gozo, and that is uh, in Malta. And uh, you are a board member of, of SONEX. And I spoke, obviously, with uh, Professor Jeffrey Lipman a couple of weeks ago. It was a, a very, very interesting conversation about um, how he works um, through climate-friendly travel uh, to build uh, climate resilience, and uh, you are directly involved with that. Um, and also, you are senior advisor for the European Bamboo Plantation Program, correct? That's right, yes. So that's, 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 I haven't missed anything, or is there anything else that you would like to uh, point out as well? or? Not really, no, that's sort of uh, basically the, the career, as it were. Uh, yeah. The only thing is, I actually started in Botswana with the Dutch Development Organization, SNV. Aha, aha. So, <laughs> so, so, that, that was the first, the first uh, assignment, basically. Oh, wow, in, in Botswana. But what did you do there, exactly? Um, I was what was called District Officer Lands, yeah. which basically meant that I was a, a civil servant of the Botswana government, right. responsible for land use planning um, and land management issues. So already in those days, um, working on environment and sustainable development. Right. So that's a that's a long, long time. You're now living um, on the island of, of Gozo, and Gozo obviously won uh, a, a few sustainable tourism uh, prizes, awards. Um, I believe at the ITB Berlin, they, they, they won an award, uh, probably because they had a strategy as well. Is this why you're living there or is there other reasons for that? Um, the main reason was just pure pure coincidence. When, when we lived in Kenya, we uh, came back to Europe for a holiday, back to the Netherlands, yeah. which is where I'm from. And we stopped over in Malta on the way because you know, the flight actually allowed us to do so. And we loved the place. So um, we, we said, this is where we're going to settle. 
Brilliant. So, so this has nothing to do with their strategy or sustainability, but it's just a nice coincidence uh, nonetheless. A, a very nice coincidence. And being here, of course, now I am involved in the discussions about how we can make Malta maybe more sustainable and how we can look at uh, the tourism sector. And I think we'll talk about that a bit later. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so first of all, long career, uh, all in, in, in uh, comes down to environment, uh, comes down to sustainability. Why? Why is that so important uh, for you? Well, I think but really, Peter, the two, the two are, are almost, you, you can't talk about one without the other. You know, mm -hmm. if you talk about sustainability, it's sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it's the only way forward, really. Um, you have to talk about nature because that's what the whole point is. And I think, you know, for me, as you say, right from, from even from before working in Africa, I mean, during my studies, I, I studied geography. So it was all about understanding natural processes, understanding how nature operates mm -hmm. um, and and therefore I, I I always felt that that you know this this is very important and when I got more into the the development aspects um, and 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 understanding more how development works and also looking at some of the negative parts of development you realize that the only way is uh, sustainable development which is working with nature yeah. I think that's really how I would call my my work at the moment it is you know what we what we call in IUCN nature-based solutions. Mm -hmm. It's 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 not looking at nature as just a, a way that we can pillage and 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 and, and utilize and, and exploit, but mm -hmm. it's working with nature on the best ways uh, to develop what we want to do. I mean, I, I I'm not a person that believes in pure protection. You know, I think sustainable development is the balance between use and protection. Uh -huh. you, I mean, I, I totally agree. You need to protect biodiversity hotspots. You know, we need to protect the, the Sundarbans. We need to protect the Okavango Delta. We need to protect the whole failure. But at the same time, the, the, there are also natural resources that can be used as long as they are used sustainably. Uh -huh. So it's it's that, that discussion on how can you work with nature, use nature, to basically promote sustainable development, development that does not destroy the resources, but mm -hmm. actually maintains the resources and, and looking at this whole concept of circular economy, bio-based economy, an economy that, that allows us to continue without depleting the resources that we have. So more practical. Practical, yes, um, and I say, I mean, I'm basically linking that that understanding of the natural resources around us, and and seeing how that fits in with development. And I think again, you know, it is so important that it's not an either or. I mean, there are still people that say, well, if you want economic development, you can't think about nature. Mm -hmm. That's not true at all. You know, the, there are so many examples now where where actually. Working with nature may even be a better way for development. I mean, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, when I when I worked in in uh, in Asia, um, we were there during the, the tsunami in 2000 and uh, gosh, 2008, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and you know, it it was. I mean, you can't say the the people wouldn't have died if nature was healthier. But undoubtedly, there were examples which showed that where the mangrove forests were still intact or at least in a healthy state, the damage on the shore was mm -hmm. less. Less houses were destroyed, fewer people died, boats actually survived. So working with mangroves as coastal protection is actually much more effective and more efficient and much cheaper than building concrete walls and, and other, uh, let's say, uh, grey infrastructure. Fair enough. But uh, obviously, 35 years um, ago, there was not much really, no one really spoke about sustainability. Actually, I read a few articles in, in at that point in Newsweek uh, in time. They were talking about global cooling, as a matter of fact, not not global warming, global cooling. Um, so that's quite exceptional to at that time already do a lot uh, with regards to the environment. True. No, it, it was it was uh, a, a different way of thinking. I mean, we were very lucky that uh, maybe surprisingly, um, former President Clinton was was basically with us, and we developed a program that that has helped countries in in uh, South Asia. You know, all the all the the, the South and Southeast Asia, really, the, mm -hmm. the island states and and the, the 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 states, the countries with coastlines, to 
restore and repair some of their mangroves. And I think that program is still ongoing. And it's actually starting up in other countries as well. I'm actually in contact with a hotel. I think it's Aruba. Um, they are building the hotel um, and supporting mangroves surrounding it at the same time. So, um, indeed. Um, then you say as well on, on LinkedIn, which I obviously I follow, uh, it says mm. there that you are promoting the integration um, of nature in socio-economic development planning. How do we see that? Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, well, maybe that example that I just gave about mangroves is an yeah. example. Uh, <laughs> okay. You know, it, it yeah. really is, is looking at how, how b- back again to what I said earlier, how can you work with nature? Let me give you another example. When 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 I, I worked in Uganda, for example, uh, again, we're talking quite some years ago, but in those, those days, a lot of the wastewater from Kampala flowed into the west wetlands of Lake Victoria. Mm-hmm. And and in fact the intake the water intake for kampala was downstream of these wetlands and we used to measure the quality of the water of course and it was basically perfectly fine so the 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 wetland actually filtrated the wastewater to a a a level of quality that allowed you to use the water again now you know kampala has grown and i'm not sure if that would still be the case but definitely the idea of using natural vegetation to clean up wastewater is something that's been applied in many 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 other countries um, including europe Mm -hmm. so you know it's again looking at how we can integrate natural resources in the environment and i think maybe the most the most uh obvious one at the moment is the whole discussion about reforestation yeah. you know we're, we're we're getting into the climate change discussions but basically there are now now major event uh, you know major activities being promoted and developed to to look at how we can plant trees mm-hmm. plant bamboo plant plant other vegetation yeah. to on the one hand uh, take CO2 out of the air, but also look at how that helps with, with land restoration, uh, land management, water management. So really, again, using you know these natural resources as a way to actually promote sustainable development, create jobs, uh, and, 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 and have an economy that is more sustainable. Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously for taking the CO2 out of the air, that will take a, a while uh, by planting trees. But obviously the forests that are there can certainly be protected. And you mentioned um, other factors as well with uh, tree planting. I believe there's quite a few projects in Africa, uh, talking about Africa, um, that are being done as well. Size of Wales, I believe, uh, has a number of projects um, uh, uh, there. Um, then, obviously, as I spoke with um, Professor uh, Geoffrey Lipman uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, with regards to Sonex, and you yourself are deeply involved in that as well. Um, how are you um, involved? Uh, are you involved directly as well, living in on, on Malta with the Maltese government? Um, how does that work for you? True. Well, as, as, as you say, you, you've talked with Jeffrey, but for those that, that have not uh, read it, um, <laughs> basically Jeffrey is heading Sun, Sunex, an, an, yeah. an, an organization and, and a movement that is promoting climate friendly travel and climate friendly tourism. Mm-hmm. And that really means that, you know, we're trying to look at, at both sides of the coin, as it were, mm-hmm. on the one hand, promoting tourism, but at the same time, looking at what the environmental and, and climate impact is. And Jeffrey's main issue is that we want to have industry that is measuring its impact that is green you know it's looking how it actually can avoid damaging the environment and that is climate friendly climate proof so it's linked to the 2050 paris uh, targets yeah um now we've managed to or i should say jeffrey has managed to convince the maltese government that this is something that would fit totally in their long-term thinking for tourism yeah. of course you know malta a small island depends a lot on tourism so there are big discussions here on what the future of tourism should be mm-hmm. and the maltese tourism authority has effectively said look this idea of of, of climate friendly tourism fits so the idea is that this whole initiative will actually be run from Malta. I know Jeffrey, we've been uh, in contact for many, many years on different issues. So when Jeffrey heard that I was settling in Malta, he basically got in touch and said, hey, <laughs> do you want to be part of this? So I'm now the, the, the 
I guess one of the one of the representatives of Sonex in Malta, yeah. working with Jeffrey on the one hand, who's still based in Brussels, and working with uh, the colleagues in the Malta Tourism Authority and in the Institute for Tourism Studies to help set up this program in Malta. Brilliant. So you're working directly with the Maltese uh, Tourism Authority with regards to Correct. this. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. And uh, what is your outlook uh, for Malta, if I may say, over the next, uh, say, 10 years? Well, I mean, of course, the current situation makes everything very difficult to predict. Yeah. Um, you know, Malta depends on tourism. I say it's a small island. There is not much industry. Um, there's a bit of, 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 of subsistence agriculture, I would say. You know, they grow fantastic uh, crops. <clears throat> but a lot of the, of the hard currency comes from tourists. Mm -hmm. Now, at the moment, there is no tourism. I mean, the borders are effectively closed. Yeah. Um, you know, tourists don't come in. And if they were to come in, they would be quarantined. So basically, nobody's coming. Yeah. Now, this is this is not a permanent situation. We all know. Nobody knows how long it's going to take. Nobody knows what will happen. But tourism will come back. And I think the issue is going to be how far will the, the, the lessons almost that we've learned from COVID mm -hmm. and, and, and the implications, how will that maybe redirect the tourism future for Malta? Do you have any idea of how it will affect uh, tourism in Malta? Will it be a positive way, uh, I take? or? Well... I, I hope that the fact that we are working with Malta on this idea of climate friendly tourism, mm -hmm. which of course is looking at the environmental impacts, that we, we will also be able to work with Malta on getting the tourism infrastructure more, more uh, geared towards environmental sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, discussing things like, like over tourism, mass tourism, is that really what we want? Um, are there maybe different ways that we can uh, promote different parts of the archipelago? Um, mm. And certainly living on Gozo, my hope is that we will be able to, to maintain a certain uh, traditional characteristics of this small island. Gozo is even smaller than Malta, and it is more traditional. And I think that's what tourists want. So, you know, if we can maintain that, that without avoiding tourism, but seeing how tourism can actually provide us the resources to, uh, to do this properly, I think there is a, a real future. Yeah, obviously it's 13% at the moment of the of GDP, right? So tourism, that's without the cruise industry and everything, from what I understand. So uh, what are the other industries that Malta has? If I, do you know or...? I honestly don't know, and I yeah. must admit, I think the the if you, if you include all the value chains of tourism, it's presumably more. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the, the agricultural production, for example, uh, is 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 something. You know, certainly we as 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 residents now uh, love the local products because. Uh, this is grown in sun sunlight without pesticides. You know, it's very agro agricultural, uh, um, um, ecological agriculture. And I think tourists like that as well. And there's still a lot of traditional handicrafts which tourists buy. So I think there is actually more in the tourism sector than might even be shown in the statistics. Fair enough. Let's go to uh, let's go to the next topic, uh, bamboo. And uh, obviously, you were director general um, of uh, <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Imbar. You're now senior advisor uh, for the European Bamboo Plantation Program. Um, I have done a podcast before with uh, Thomas Graham of uh, Mad Travel in the Philippines. He was involved as well uh, with uh, partnering with the indigenous tribes to bring back the forest and also planting bamboo. And from what I understand, it's it's not it's not really it's not really forestry, right? It's uh, something totally different. Well, um, I guess to put it this way, bamboos look like trees, but they are not trees. They mm. are actually grasses, giant grasses. Okay. And 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 that that you know it's it's a sort of the crux of the whole issue. Um, bamboos are, are very interesting. I must admit, I, I was five years um, as the head of this organization. I had the privilege of being the, the director general, which is basically the CEO of the organization. And the organization was in itself interesting. It's the only intergovernment organization. So it's it's like the United Nations in a way okay. that has its headquarters in China. And at the moment, I don't know exactly, I left last year, we had about 46 states as members and three observers. So by now, there must be about 50 governments that are members of this organization. Mm -hmm. And that, in a, in a way, is one of the issues already, because a lot of people think that bamboo is a Chinese plant. Okay. Um, and that's not true at all. 
in in fact to start with there are about when we did some some research with Kew Gardens in this in the, in the UK okay. we they discovered for us that there were 1642 different species and I think since that time that was in 2016 they've even found a few more and the latest statistics are 1660 so there are there are many different types of bamboo mm -hmm. um, there's about 1,500 or so of those bamboos that are what's called woody bamboos, and they look like trees. And they they grow in China, in India, in Indonesia, and in the Philippines, in all the Asian countries um, towards Japan. But they also grow in Africa, and all they right. grow in Latin America and in the Caribbean. So bamboo is not at all a plant that is just Asian. And that was, for me, really one of the, the most interesting aspects, that we were working a lot with countries in Asia, in Africa, for example, yeah. on, you know, sustainable development, community development, working with people to see how they can use their bamboos more effectively, more efficiently. Yeah. Um, and the great thing is, because it's grass, you know, unlike trees, as if you cut a tree, you have to replant it. And there's, there's of course, lots of concern about cutting trees and, and destroying forests. Yep. Bamboo is a, is a grass. So, in fact, managing bamboo is like basically ma managing an agricultural crop. So it grows so very fast, and I take it? It grows fast, but it grows even faster if you use it. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the big thing with bamboo. The best way to manage a bamboo forest, a bamboo plantation, is to use it. Okay. Sustainably, again, you need to know how to use it because clear cutting is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. But basically, it's a question of taking out the older bamboo poles. And old for bamboo means five, six, seven years. So we're not talking, you know, the sort of timelines that you talk when you grow trees and you want to years, plant yeah. forests. Mm -hmm. You're talking about, say, five, six, seven years. Those are the ones you cut. New ones grow. Um, and basically, the, the bamboo forest keeps going. That that is that is amazing. I was the I, I traveled so obviously all over Asia, all over Africa as well. I, I didn't see well. It's quite a while ago. I must admit, I didn't see any bamboo in in Africa. Where which countries are we talking about? Um, if I may ask. It's a funny thing, Pedro. I lived twelve years in Africa and I never saw bamboo. Okay. But <laughs> now that now that I've been the director general of bamboo, yeah. when I when I go to Kenya, I see bamboo everywhere. Of course. When I go to Ethiopia, <laughs> I see bamboo everywhere. It's like buying fact, a car, basically. You the car you want to buy, you see everywhere all of a sudden, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, okay. um, bamboo grows um, basically sub Sahara, yeah. everywhere north of the Kalahari. Okay. You know, it's the coffee belt, effectively. And we don't really know how many hectares of bamboo there are in Africa because they've never really measured it. But to give you an example, we did a, a study in East Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda. Just those three countries have about one and a half million hectares of bamboo. Wow. Okay. No, I was not uh, not aware of that. And I did travel through all of those countries, uh, I must say, as well. Um, so this is also very sustainable, I uh, I reckon. And why is that uh, Why is that so? What, what, what is your opinion? Why do you think it's very sustainable? How does it act as um, as as a carbon sink for uh, CO two? What is your opinion about it? Well, first let's talk about the sustainability. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as, as I as I said, it's a grass, yeah. and basically, you know, how do you maintain your lawn? You cut the grass, and yep. the grass grows back. That's the best way. Um, every every football pitch owner will tell you that. Now that's the same with bamboo. As I said, if you have a bamboo stand, if you leave it. Unlike with the tree plantation, it will eventually degrade and you'll find very much use of the bamboos. But if you take the bamboo poles that are mature out, new poles will grow every year. There is a growth season and you can basically have a totally renewable um, process where you generate new bamboos by cutting the old bamboos. So it is the ultimate of sustainability. Okay. Uh, fair enough, and it can be transformed in a lot of different uh, different things as well. Uh, and the uh, gentleman from the Philippines, he talked about straws, bamboo straws, um, reusable um, uh, straws. Is that something that that um, that you see as a positive? Or? Well, it's one of the of the many many uses. I mean, mm -hmm. we actually recorded um, ten thousand different uses, and I would say bamboo straws is one of them. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the whole discussion about um, you know whether plastic straws are good or bad for the environment, or rather, plastic straws are bad for the environment, mm -hmm. bamboo is a, is a, is an, an an alternative. But I don't think that the world will change by using bamboo straws. Mm -hmm. There are some some much more um, interesting aspects of of bamboo. 
I think the most important aspect is actually construction. Um, you know, you may not realize, but in Latin America, bamboo is used to construct houses that are earthquake proof. Um, so in <laughs> fact, a lot of people prefer living in houses that are made with bamboo than concrete, because they've seen concrete houses tumble down whilst yeah. the bamboo structures stand. Um, Why is there, that? that? There are millions of people that live in bamboo houses in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. I, I never, I never, I never heard of of, of of that. Why is it more? Why is it more stable than than um, than cement or any other uh, man-made material? Bamboo bends and doesn't break. Simple as that. Simple as that. Okay. Okay. So, so I mean, yeah. you know, that there. After the earthquake in Ecuador yeah. um, in 2016, I believe it was, um, basically, you know, we, we did some, some research, sent out a few uh, experts, um, engineers, architects who went around and looked at what's happening. And the result is that the Ecuador government has actually adapted its building codes so that people can rebuild with bamboo and get credits and, and, and benefits to do so, because it is such an obvious uh, opportunity. Is it durable? Um, is bamboo durable as a as a building material? Um, that's one of the issues. Bamboo is very strong, yep. but bamboo is eaten by termites and insects because it has a lot of um, uh, what's the word? Gosh, well, basically the the the, the fiber um, is 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 soft and and, and can be eaten. Um, mm -hmm. So unless you treat bamboo it would certainly deteriorate. But treating bamboo is not difficult. I mean, you can do it with borax, which is a natural salt, mm -hmm. which is the standard way. There are also ways of, of you know, using chemicals, which we would not uh, promote, but it's mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. But once treated, bamboo houses can stand for years. I mean, again, if you go back to, to places like Indonesia or the Philippines or China itself, you know, the, in, in the southern um, regions of China, there are, there are houses, there are bridges that are 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. Okay. Oh, that, 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 so that's uh, that's pretty similar then, I would say. And and if I may ask, um, uh, obviously, how, what kind of an area is needed to grow a bamboo, and um, how does that uh, compare to uh, to forests? Um, how long is a piece of string? Yeah. You know, basically, <laughs> basically um, if if you look at China. China yeah. has planted 3 million hectares of bamboo in yeah. the last well, 20, 30 years or so. Yeah. So they have 3 million hectares of basically production forest. They have another 3 million hectares of natural bamboo. Um, so that 6 million hectares produces the products for an industry that is currently worth about 30 billion US dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I say some of that bamboo is natural bamboo, for example, with the, the, the pandas live, that's not used for production at all. You know, pandas eat very different types. The, th the, the three million hectares that is planted is basically mainly what is called moso bamboo, it's the Philostachys um, variety, and that is used for a, an enormous variety of, of products. Um, in Africa, there are natural bamboos. They are different ones. Um, so it's, uh, you know, if, if you want to develop an industry in Africa, for example, you would try and use the, the local bamboos. Um, but again, it depends what you what you want to create. If you are looking to, for example, uh, construction, mm -hmm. you may need uh, a certain a number of bamboo poles per hectare um, and therefore a different area. If you're looking for paper production, it's mm -hmm. different. If you're looking for furniture, it may be different again. So it really depends what you actually want to use the bamboo for to decide how much you want to plant. Fair enough, fair enough. And uh, obviously you're now senior advisor for the European uh, bamboo plantation program. How do you see this work in Europe? Uh, what do you advocate in, in, in Europe for that? And um, how do you see what works in Asia in terms of uh, construction, furniture, um, straws? How do you see that working in, in, in Europe? And where do you see that working in Europe? Um, very interesting question. Basically, you know, what we what we looked at is we said on the one hand, you've got the European Green Deal now, but before that, there were already, you know, discussions in, in the common agricultural policy. How can we re revive the agricultural development in Southern Europe? Mm -hmm. Farmers are leaving the land. You know, what was planted before is very often no longer viable. In some cases, they imported uh, 
tree species like like eucalyptus that are not good for soil in other cases um, for whatever reasons you know crops basically failed so there is an interest in in reviving the agriculture in southern europe and at the same time now there's a little discussion about planting trees for carbon capture mainly carbon sinks but also for other reasons with tree planting the issue always is it takes so long for a tree to become mature you know you're talking 10 15 20 years yep. and any farmer will say yeah that's great but what am i what am i going to do in, in in the 20 years whilst i'm waiting for those trees to mature mm -hmm. so there's that question um and and with that, we decided, well, would it be worthwhile, would it be possible to grow bamboo? So we've tested in, in Portugal and in Spain and in Italy whether you can grow bamboo, not just us. There are other people there as well. I mean, there are bamboo societies in those countries. Okay. And the answer is, yes, the climate is actually very, very good for bamboo. So bringing those two together, where you on the one hand have a demand to look at how you can restore the agriculture. There is an opportunity at the moment to work within the European Green, Green Deal on creating carbon sinks by planting vegetation and looking at the opportunities that bamboo could provide by creating a small industry in Southern Europe. Mm -hmm. We think that this is very realistic. Okay. One of the added values, of course, is at the moment, uh, Europe is one of the main markets for bamboo products, but most of the bamboo comes from the other side of the world. Yep. If you could actually get your bamboo from Europe, you know, the carbon footprint for the... Yeah, much more sustainable. Yeah, of course. Much, much less. Yeah, that makes so, all sense. Yeah. So that is why we thought, well, mm. this may be something that would actually work. I must admit, though, I mean, the one the one big question, and this is, of course, one of the issues that with my IOCN hat, I am always aware of, we would be introducing basically a, a non-native species. You know, Europe does not have bamboo. There is in the Mediterranean region a, a, a reed called Arundona donax, which is like bamboo, but it is, you know, it, it's still a grass family, but it is not uh, ecologically, not, not biologically a bamboo species. So you are introducing new species into Europe. And that is, of course, an issue that we have to be careful about. Our argument is, it's, it's an agricultural product. You know, we are basically promoting it not as a natural reforestation uh, tool, but as an agricultural issue. So really growing a crop, managing it as a crop, and therefore reducing the risks. Yeah. Is it, do you have the feeling that you're educating um, uh, the people here in Europe a lot about bamboo as opposed to just introducing it? Um, Huh, that's a good question. Um, I guess the education that I'm trying trying to to promote is is through through LinkedIn and, and social media. Yeah. We do we. I mean, I'm working with a company, and we do not have an educational program. That's not really um, in in our um, yeah in our in our portfolio. No, uh, I, I I mean really that's uh, as you're introducing something that's not really a natural crop in Europe. Um, you have to educate people um, really about about the, the positives and and um, really all the sustainable aspects, the CO2 capture of bamboo and so on, um, as opposed to just saying, hey, let's just bob, uh, plant some bamboo. No, no, true. I mean, uh, the, again, let's be totally honest here. It comes back to the whole issue of sustainable development. If yeah. there isn't an economic benefit, you're not going to get a farmer to say, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll plant something new. Yeah. So we, we have to explain what the options are. And of course, one of the options is that, that yes, once we have created a plantation, and I say, let's be honest, it's still going to take five, six years before you have a standing crop. Yeah. But then those poles can be sold. You know, there is a market and we know that market. Um, and what we would like to do then at that stage is even see if we can promote small industry, local industry, by manufacturing possibly straws, I don't know, but maybe, you know, furniture or, or, or other small utensils or, or literally pre-processing the bamboo for construction. Because I think that's the other issue, you know, I talked about the houses in, in, in Latin America and Africa. Yep. In Europe, bamboo is used in a very different way. Here it's what is called engineered bamboo, and it is effectively um, what you would do is split the bamboo pole, which is round, into into bamboo strips, and you glue the bamboo strips back together to create a a a, a panel or a or a square beam, which of course for construction is much more um, useful. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And is it is it is it more viable for um, for farmers here in Europe uh, to plant uh, economically viable to plant bamboo as opposed to other other crops? Um, well, the thing is, bamboo does not actually need that much water, um, mm. which is contrary to what most people think. You have to you have to water a, 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 a nursery, yes. But once the bamboo is established, it doesn't need that much water, so it is better than some of the other crops that would need a lot of irrigation. Um, but you know, it's really a question of okay, a variety, I guess, is the spice of, of life. Um, you don't want to end up with one monoculture plantation of, of bamboo, for example. You also don't want to end up with modern culture plantation of something else. So it's really looking at how we can introduce bamboo in the agricultural landscape as an as an agroforestry crop, because it is sort of, you know, half forestry, half agriculture. Mm -hmm. And if possible, mixing it with other species. Fair bamboo, yeah. bamboo will certainly allow intercropping. You know, again, unlike, for example, eucalyptus, which which basically kills the soil, um, in, in, in places like, like in India, where there's a lot of bamboo, they grow medicinal plants and herbs under the bamboo. They use it as a, as a, as a shade species. Okay, and then we have also um, a few articles um, that I saw on bamboo as a carbon sink. And... Um, are some very positive uh, articles, one from the Food and Agriculture Organization, the uh, FAO. They say that, um, well, basically, uh, biomass carbon storage in bamboo is uh, very comparable to um, to trees. And uh, they say it's the poor man's carbon sink, uh, uh, really. And they, what they say, it's, it's often overlooked in current climate change regimes, and it should really... Um, be uh, included in the IPCC assessments, and mm. um, that that's one point. The other point, and that comes from two articles, one from uh, phys.org, and the other one is from National Geographic, and they both say that um, repla replacing trees with bamboo, so that, that's totally different from planting immediately, but it's taking, taking the trees away and replacing it with bamboo, they say halves the carbon storage capacity, um, of of, yes. of of forests and the one from National Geographic. I don't, yeah, I don't even want to go into the one from National Geographic. They only tested really on on two plants over grown over a very short period of time. Um, but the other mm, one, yeah, I'm not sure. Exactly how, what, yeah, what, what do you what do you feel about? How do you feel about this? What what do you think? Uh, what what are your thoughts? Well, I guess it, it would be utterly stupid to to cut a forest and plant bamboo. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's the last thing we would promote. Of course, natural forests, tropical forests are much bigger uh, carbon sinks. Mangroves are presumably even better. But the argument that, that I would make and the argument we're making in Southern Europe and the argument we've made in, 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 in Africa is to plant bamboo on degraded land is a very smart move and economically a very smart move as well. Bamboo grows in, in, in very bad soils. It doesn't need a lot of organic matter. It doesn't need fertilizer. It's basically, again, it's a grass, you know, so it, it will establish itself in degraded soils. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the very interesting things that is happening in several countries now is to use bamboo to clean up degraded or to clean up polluted soils so really looking at the phytoremediation potential you know and plant bamboo on 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 on, on uh, mine uh, heaps that are basically you know waste of, of 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 quarries waste of mines to clean up the dirty soil that's a possibility but i totally agree to actually cut a forest to plant bamboo would be the the the, the, the stupidest thing to do no God, I, I fully agree with that article and with that statement. And that's certainly not what we would uh, promote and certainly not something I would promote. That makes sense. Um, then I saw a few um, articles as well. Uh, one that you linked uh, linked to on, on, um, on LinkedIn and um, talking um, about bamboo as an energy source, uh, biomass. And mm. um, well, they, they, you, you, obviously you, you afforded that article on, on LinkedIn and uh, they say that it's really the next green gasoline material. Um, what, what, what do they mean there, biomass? How does it compare to other energy sources that, that we have? Can you make coal out of it, I read somewhere? Is that correct? Or? Um, coal is maybe, yes, well, charcoal. Charcoal, yeah. yeah. Um, very much so, yes. I think again, Peter. The issue is um, you are you are using grass. So you know, charcoal is 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 the 
the fuel for uh, rural communities uh, in Africa. Yeah. I think about 80% of the people in Africa still cook on charcoal. Most of the charcoal is currently harvested very often illegally by cutting trees. Now, if you could actually use a grass species to grow and, and convert that into charcoal, you would basically transform an illegal activity in a total legal economic possibility. So yes, using bamboo as a source of charcoal is certainly an option. Mm -hmm. um, it's presumably not the best use of bamboo because there are other things you can do with bamboo, as I just said, mm -hmm. uh, the construction um, and, 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 you know, other ways of using bamboo for product development that are giving you a higher return on investment. But what you could do then is use the waste to make charcoal. So mm -hmm. certainly using bamboo as a as a renewable source of local energy is something that makes an awful lot of sense for Africa. It doesn't make sense for every country, maybe. I mean, I know in China, for example, bamboo, oh, sorry, charcoal is not really used that much. So mm -hmm. in, in China, Although charcoal is produced from bamboo, it is there used as activated charcoal for water filtration, air purification, so a much higher level, uh, much higher value use of the bamboo. Now, what, what Jay Wahono is, is promoting in, in, uh, in Indonesia, which is the, the article I think you refer to, is to actually use bamboo as a biofuel. So basically, you just put it in a gasifier just like any other biofuel. Um, and again, the difference is that, you know, biofuel has a bad name because people use grain, they use corn, they use basically foodstuff. Yep. And of course, to use foodstuff as a biofuel is not necessarily the best use the, if you actually can feed people. What we're saying here is you use grass. Um, you know, okay, the grass that there are things there as well related to food production because bamboo shoots can be eaten. Okay. But, you know, bamboo shoots, uh, basically you take out 50% of the shoots that grow every year, you still have a very healthy crop of new bamboo poles. So um, eating the shoots is not going to stop the regeneration of the bamboo forest. And you can then use those poles for a biofuel. Again, what I would say is you presumably take out the best part of the pole. I mean, you know, bamboo is, 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 is stronger and more useful at the bottom end of the pole than at the top. And you use the top bits and the offcuts and whatever waste there is for biofuel production. The good thing is it's totally off the grid. And and this is you know what Jay Waono is doing in Indonesia. He's he is working in Mentawai Islands. This is a, a group of small islands in you know far off Sumatra. I mean they won't be on the national grid for I don't know, decades presumably. Mm -hmm. Um the same applies to some of the rural areas in Africa, maybe, you know, villages that most likely will not be on the on the grid for a long time. Their option is to either use solar panels, which is, of course, a very cheap way of creating energy these days. The problem with the solar panel is that once it breaks down, you may have a problem. And, and to train people how to manufacture or repair solar panels is a whole different issue. If you can use a biofuel that is available and that grows around your school, around your health post, around your village, it would be one option. So yes, bamboo for energy, both as a charcoal or as a biofuel is definitely a possibility. Okay, that, that, makes, um, that makes sense as well, I would say. So the last topic here, um, the virus, we touched on it a little bit um, already, of course. Um, the uh, what 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 does it uh, what does it mean for travel? What do you think it means for travel? Obviously, a lot of people say, well, travel is going to change immensely uh, once uh, we get back to it at a certain point, um, uh, of course. And some people say, well, people will not fly that much anymore. To be more careful about where they fly, um, people say that the whole life will basically you know change once once it, uh, once lockdown uh, is over. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you see travel um, over the next uh, coming years? Will people travel less? Will they be more responsible? Will they take, take out travel insurance, which does not cover the coronavirus anyways? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and even less so in the future, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> a small print. I'll put another small print there. Any virus will not cover yours. Uh, anyway. It's true. <laughs> no. Um, yes, I think you, you're quite right. This will change. I mean, I think it will change a lot of things. Um, I hope the positive 
if I can even dare say that, mm -hmm. positive result of, of the whole crisis is that people will realize uh, some some good things. You know, I mean, I think certainly the the resurgence of or the re restoration of nature naturally is a is a fascinating aspect. Yeah. You know, where people are saying that all of a sudden. Um, Dolphins are coming back in places where they haven't been seen for for years on end. Birds are, are clear skies, are... unbelievable. Yeah. Yes. So you know, nature is resilient, and I think that is something. Okay, it's not answering your question about tourism, but it is certainly something that I find interesting. And 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 I think you know, as 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 and IUCN we... and hopefully a future IUCN councillor, this is something that 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 certainly is important. And I think we can learn from that. That by by actually leaving nature alone, it will be able to repair a lot of the damage that we've done. I think as as far as the travel is concerned, I guess to be frank, one of the biggest knock off knock effects will be on mass travel, mass tourism. And and I'm personally not too worried about that because I think um, mass tourism is not necessarily the best form of tourism. But I can imagine that people would be very reluctant to be in, in large groups, um, certainly for the coming months, if not years, not knowing whether that would you know, expose them to potential risks, mm -hmm. potential health risks. I think individual tourists will presumably find that um, the world hasn't changed that much. Say maybe the world has become a little bit greener, even. So I think they they, they will definitely bounce back. Um, and again, I think looking at, at my own little island here, I hope that that is the case because I think high high quality, low value, low volume tourism is presumably more more beneficial for a country like like Malta and certainly for an island like Gozo than high volume, low value tourism. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. You say leave, leave nature alone. And uh, I actually saw once again an article that uh, you linked to, and that was uh, by Jane Goodall uh, saying disrespect to, uh, for animals caused uh, the pandemic. Is that something that you agree with? Or? Um, I agree that you know, we, by, by, by actually destroying nature, we've presumably made the risks for pandemics, the risks for new viruses higher. I mean, I think there's already very clear uh, indications that, 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 you know, things like, like, like yes, ecosystem degradation, cutting more forests, um, that makes life more vulnerable. And it, it also means that people get in touch with animals that they might not have been in touch with in the past. So, yes, I think destroying nature makes the risks higher. But I have to say, I mean, there is one aspect which I think is important, and, and that's something that is maybe missed a little bit. A lot of the areas that at the moment are managed in particularly developing countries in the third world depend on tourists. You know, national parks are very often not able to maintain their services, their, their monitoring, their control, their, their, their educational activities, um, and, and also their work with local communities that live around the national park if there is no funding. And that funding is very often from tourists. Yeah. So by actually cutting out the, let's say, the nature-based tourism, you are running the risk that all of a sudden ranges cannot be paid any longer, uh, vehicles can't go to places, and you might find that poachers find all of a sudden they have more chance, illegal people are getting into forests and cut trees that they shouldn't be doing. Um, because the monitoring and the, and, and, and the policing is no longer possible. So that is, I think, the other side of, of the coin, that, that yes, we should leave nature alone and we should not destroy nature, but we also should protect what, what we have, and that needs resources. And very often those resources are, are augmented by, if not supported by, tourism. Yeah, now I've heard that before, especially about the uh, the, the, the the parks in in Africa. Uh, they are maintained by tourism, and sometimes even by by people which I personally don't particularly like. Uh, people who go there for hunting, trophy hunting. Um, that sure. so there's two sides of the coin there. You never know how much money or um, actually goes directly to to the uh, to the parks itself, but. Um, yeah, no, yeah, that's that's definitely the case. I mean, this is always the issue, isn't it? I mean, who do you work with on on 
in, in the countries. And I mean, having lived in many of those countries, I know that there are always big questions. But very often you'll find that there are local organizations, you know, whether they're NGOs or community groups, yeah. that, that, that actually would be able to use that money in a very, very good way. So it's really working out the best mechanisms. And I think, again, this is where... At the moment, with with the whole international travel world being completely stymied, um, these are these are risks that that yeah we'll find that some of those groups that were expecting income and were hoping to have um, you know people coming in to to see the the, the beauty of their areas mm -hmm. um, are all of a sudden without source of income yeah. and then you know a very difficult thing of course for people that are hungry if their option is wait for the tourists or go out and start hunting, well, I guess I know what I would do if I was a local person and I had no other options. Yeah, obviously, if you if you have no money and your family is starving, you have to do something at a certain point. Fair, fair, I would say so. Um, then, um, obviously, there, there, I must say, there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of zoos and aquariums are closing down and closing down permanently now as well, I believe, all over the world, right? How do yes. you feel about that, if I may ask? Well, um, I mean, zoos and aquariums is <laughs> there's a whole different issue there. Again, yeah. you know, I mean, if if animals could be left in where, where they they have their natural environment, I would I would be happier. The issue is that in many cases, zoos and aquaria have animals that were either born in captivity yeah. and therefore, if you would release them in the wild, they presumably die within days. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think a lot of zoos and aquaria actually have a role to. Um, as, 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 as I don't want to say hospitals, I'm not sure what the, what the right word would be, but, you know, the animals that are that are either um, ill or, or were found because people tried to export them illegally, whatever, they will end up in zoos and aquaria as well. So there is actually that very positive aspect. And of course, they are very important for educational purposes, because a lot of people, you know, again, poor people in, 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 in I don't know, uh, even in Europe or in the States may not have the opportunity to travel to Africa and see elephants there, mm -hmm. but they might be able to see elephants in, in a, a nature park. The issue there is really how do you manage it properly? How do you make sure that these animals have, you know, an, an environment that is as natural as possible? They have the space, which is mainly the issue, you know, not being cooped up in a small cage, but actually having the opportunity to go out and walk about as if they were in the wild. Um, and then the the educational value, I think, is very important as well. And research as well on top of that, um, I, I would say. Um, but uh, indeed. So where can find people more... Um about you and about organizations <laughs> that you uh, that that you uh, that you work with well as i say my, my i guess my main my main form of, of getting the message out is through linkedin yep. uh, so anybody on linkedin can find me there i do have a, a, a blog at the moment i don't have a website yet i am thinking about it because as i said earlier i am standing as a counselor for iucn yep. and i think it therefore would be useful but the covid the covid 19 crisis has all of a sudden put a, a little spanner in the works there i was having an appointment with a local man to help me set it up that hasn't happened yet Okay, so but uh, the IUCN is IUCN.org, I take it, or yes, IUCN is IUCN.org, um, and that is basically anything you want to know about nature conservation and biodiversity. Um, on bamboo, I guess the 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 website to go to would be www.inbar.int. Yeah. Okay. Um, because Inbar is really the the global depository of bamboo issues. Fair enough. And the European part of that that you are an advisor for, European Bamboo Plantation Program, has got a website? That's, or? Yes, that's basically Bamboo Logic. Bamboo Logic. Bamboo, bamboo logic .eu. Dot, Okay, right. Okay, fair enough. And then um, was there was there was there another one? And of we have Sanex, of course. Sanex. Uh, Sanex. Yeah. Which already, you, you've already. Uh, yeah. Uh, that yeah. Prefer, prefer <laughs> and there will soon be a Sanex Malta, but again, that has not yet happened okay. because things are at the moment uh, <laughs> in limbo. <laughs> on, yeah. Exactly. On yeah. hold. <laughs> Is there anything else that you would like to mention at this point? Anything that that's important that you really want to get out? No, I think it's been it's been great talking to you. I mean, uh, uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. I mean, it's it's you know it, it's it's always good to share ideas, to share thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. But say, I guess as a as a final word, uh, nature based solutions is for me the, the 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 future for sustainable development, and I see bamboo as one of the options. Um, 
So, you know, for me, working in, in, in that area of how to work with nature and how to see how we can protect the biodiversity hotspots and work with other areas to see how best uh, we can promote sustainable development is, is the way forward. That makes total sense. Thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So that was the podcast with Hans Friedrich. Uh, it was great to have him on the show. I'll put all the links in the show notes. You can find the latest news on podcasts.earth. You've been listening to Peter de Vries. Thank you very much for doing so. Please tune in next time to a travel companion. And please stay safe, stay healthy, and stay at home. Mm-hmm.